got our worship service in just a few minutes. We appreciate your interest. It'll begin shortly. Thank you. Morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Woodell Worship Service this morning. If you'd like to be over our song books, our first song will be 176. 176. Next song will be 786. 786. And after this, we'll have our Bible reading and prayer. <clears throat> Let us see. When my way grow a drear, precious Lord lingered
invitation will be 909. 909 will be the song of invitation. The scripture reading this morning is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 9. <clears throat> For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was rose again the third day and according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, whom the greater part remained to the present, but some had fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. It's a beautiful Lord's Day, and we thank you so much for that. We thank you for this privilege of coming together to worship you without no outside interference. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds that we can receive the message this morning and live it out in our everyday life. Father, we have many in our congregation that's very sick, and also some of your children all over the world that is sick. We ask that it be thy will, Father, that you restore them to their much wanted health. We ask that you go with us now through this whole <clears throat> worship service and may it be acceptable to you. 
and forgive us of our sins. We pray in Christ's name. Good morning and, and welcome again to all those who are here today. It's so, such a great privilege to gather together as members of the Wooddale Body Believers to enjoy the, the privilege of, of worship. If you haven't got a bulletin, please do so. There's important information there. But first of all, let me make an announcement for all announcement for all the men. This coming Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, we'll meet here in the auditorium for a very important men's business meeting. All those business meetings are important. One topic of discussion will be about uh, the relaxing, the relaxing of the, the rules and requirements for masking. You know, a lot of the those older members have had the vaccine shots, and we need to. People are asking, when can we finally all get together? How soon? And any uh, restrictions and so forth. So those matters will be discussed. We need all the men to gather together, provide input for that. Other things regarding elders and things like that will also be discussed. It's a very important men, meeting need the input of all the men yeah, that will come. In the bulletin, we have several additions to the list. Keep Fran Finley in your prayers. She underwent surgery the other day. She's having been having problems with a cyst on her gallbladder. Uh, and I found out this morning that they removed the gallbladder. Uh, she's still there. She's been very slow to recover. Her alertness has not come back as they had hoped. She fell last night. And so things have not gone well, and hopefully she'll be able to gain enough strength to come home very soon. But she certainly needs your prayers. Others are on that list that need your help. Uh, Glenn Taylor and others, who, and Bob was in the hospital for a while. He's back with us. But there are people that certainly need and deserve your prayerful support. And so we hope and pray that you'll provide that. But you can't do that unless you have a bulletin and know what's going on. If you will, be open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. And also the book of Acts chapter 1 will give you two places. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 will be a major chapter, a major text of the Bible that we'll consider today. There's a question raised. It's a question that's been on the lips of man since man's been on this earth. If a man dies, shall he live again? That question is posed and recorded in the book of Job. But as we well know, anybody who's ever lived on this earth wonders about life after death. Is there such a thing? Most people certainly hope so. Well, how can we know for sure? Well, that's where the Bible comes into to the foreplay, into the forefront. Uh, two weeks ago, people throughout our land and throughout the world gathered together for the annual spring Easter service. That'd be a time when the, even in spite of the COVID, you probably have more people coming then and also than any other time of the year. Uh, Christmas time was also another time. But I mentioned then that I was not going to do a, a sermon on the resurrection on that day and explain what in the church we don't celebrate Easter we celebrate the Lord's uh, Supper, Lord's death, burial and resurrection every Lord's day and there's a Bible precedent and a pattern for that but I mentioned then for someone to really be able to appreciate the resurrection they need, need to appreciate first the cross because those people that only consider the resurrection don't consider why Jesus came Jesus came to die and seek and save that which was lost. Our sins demanded that he come. Our God is a God who's perfect in all attributes. He's perfect in love. He's per perfect in mercy. He's perfect in his grace and consideration for people. But he's also a holy God. He's also a just God. And because of that, and because God made his free moral agents, he loved us enough to give us the freedom to choose. Everyone chooses eventually evil. And there's a place reserved for people who have chosen that and not taken care of the sin problem. And the only way that the sin problem can be perfectly resolved is for the Lord Jesus. One of the members of the Godhead, no one else would be worthy of offering a sacrifice, a vicarious sacrifice, to pay for the sins of many. And so we looked at that. We looked at the cross. We looked at John chapter 12. And Jesus talked about the time has come, you know, for him to receive the glory of that he's due, but nobody considered the cross at the time a means whereby he could receive glory. And we looked at that. We looked at it in our own lives and how through first uh, the suffering came and then the glory, and that's for us. We have to, there are things that we'll go through in life and have to endure. These things help to drive out the impure qualities of our life and help to instead put the character in as we desire to be like our Lord. 
And so today we want to consider then, with the two sermons as a background, things about, about the resurrection. And really the, the sermon only has two main points. First of all, the reality of it. Did it actually take place? And secondly, the relevance of it. What does it really mean? First of all, a few minutes, the reality of the resurrection. Anybody here believe that Jesus was resurrected from the grave? There are reasons for that. How important is it? It's extremely important, as many of you well know. The reality of the matter is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is more than a fairy tale. It's more than a legend. It's more than just a religious symbol. The reality is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the foundation of Christianity. If there's no resurrection, folks, we're here in vain. There's no reason to come and to give our lives if there's no resurrection. It's just a hoax if it was not true. I've got some quotes that I've kept in my files for a long time about the resurrection and the importance of it. I think these are well worded in the sense and the reason why I keep them in my notes and read them. A fellow by the name of William Lane Craig wrote concerning the resurrection, without the belief in the resurrection, the Christian faith could not have come into being. The disciples would have remained crushed and defeated men. Even had they continued to remember Jesus as their beloved teacher, his crucifixion would have forever silenced any hopes of his being the Messiah. The cross would have been remained the sad and shameful end of his career. The origin of Christianity therefore hinges on the belief of the early disciples that God raised Jesus from the dead. And I agree with that. I think all of you would. A fellow by the name of W.J. Sparrow Simpson also wrote, If the resurrection is not a historic fact, then the power of death remains unbroken, and with, and with it the effect of sin. And the significance of Christ's death remains uncertified, and accordingly believers are yet in their sins precisely where they were before they even heard of the name Jesus. And finally, Wilbur Smith, the author of one of the books that we used when I was going to school and preaching years ago, the resurrection of Christ is the very citadel of the Christian faith. This is the doctrine that turned the world upside down in the first century, that lifted Christianity, that lifted Christianity preeminently above Judaism and all the pagan religions of the Mediterranean world. If this goes, so must also everything else that is vital and unique in the gospel of our Lord. Even though it's already read well and you hear it, but Donnie, let's look at that passage again. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, but we're going to read all the way down through verse 19. A rather lengthy reading, but important to help us appreciate the resurrection and the reality of it and how important it is. Verse 1. Over brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you're saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which, that which I also received, that Christ died for sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. The last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of new time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly, that they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. 
And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiful. Folks, let me assert the resurrection of Christ is a historical fact. We know from history where Jesus was born. We know the name of his parents. We know the cities where he labored. We know the conditions that existed in the Roman Empire. We know the names of reigning kings and governors. We know the chain of command. We know the manner of taxation. We know dozens of other facts that are, that are authenticated by history. History has recorded these things for us. There is nothing mythological about the life of Christ. The facts of the resurrection are, verifi are verifiable in time and space. The evidence can be weighed, can be tested, and can be proven as any other fact of history might be. There's far more information available regarding the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus than the records of Caesar at Gaul, or the burning of Rome, or Hannibal Cross in the Alps. If the testimony of the witnesses of Christ and the documents given for our faith cannot be accepted, no other fact in history can be verified. Do you understand what I'm saying? All those of you that took history, studied all about all these different things, there are archaeological evidence, there are facts, historical documents that assure us that those things are true. And they're recorded for us to learn, to learn. And so also are the facts of the resurrection of our Lord. Jesus showed himself alive to the apostles after the resurrection. We saw that in the first of chapter 15. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 1 and look at the statement made by Dr. Luke about that and what he was doing on earth here after his resurrection. Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 3 with me if you will. Acts 1 verse 3. Let's start with verse 1. Acts 1 verse 1, the former account I made on Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given a commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive, talking about the apostles, after his suffering by many infallible, it's a question, proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Of God. So the fact of Jesus' resurrection and living here on this earth cannot be denied. And I'm just going to give you a list of them. We've already read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But the appearance of Christ, if you believe the Bible, then you believe 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here's a list that I've put together for years that I look at. The appearances of Christ after the resurrection show unquestionably that he was raised. First of all, to Mary Magdalene. And the other Mary, after they saw the angel, that's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 10. To Mary Magdalene at the sepulcher on her second visit. That's recorded in John chapter 20, Mark chapter 16. To Peter is recorded. Not only in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 mentioned there, but Luke chapter 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5, we saw Peter there. To Cleopas and the other disciples, we've looked often at Luke chapter 24. The story of how the Cleopas and the other disciples were leaving town. How Jesus disguised his looks and met up with them. They came back to attest of that. That's in Mark chapter 16 and Luke chapter 24. To the ten apostles, Thomas not being present, and others whose names are not given at an evening meal. Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, John 20. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that. A week later to the, to the eleven apostles, John chapter 20. To several disciples of the Sea of Galilee while they were fishing, he appeared. John chapter 21. To the apostles and about 500 brethren at once on a mountain in Galilee, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. To James, as mentioned in the first Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. To the apostles at Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, immediately prior to his ascension to heaven, he appeared. For those people who say, I believe the Bible, I don't believe the resurrection, you can't believe the Bible without believing the resurrection. The resurrection is one of the greatest and grandest themes in all of Scripture. And Christians cannot see that. The first followers of Christ had to be convinced of the resurrection. We looked at that time and time again. Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 20. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. 
I'll be killed at the hands of the high priest. And I'll be raised the third day. Remember how many times we've gone through that? But if you look at Luke chapter 24 and other passages in the gospel accounts, when the ladies come back, Luke chapter 24, and told the, the disciples he's risen, they say, you're talking like crazy women. So this is something the disciples had to be convinced of. They didn't, as some say, begin to spread the hoax that he was risen, as people claim. The disciples were the first ones to have to be convinced, and they became convinced. And then the Apostle Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if there was ever anyone in Judaism who would say, let me show you the evidence there's no such a person as Jesus, Paul, Saul, as he's known, they would have provided that. But he, did, he believed that initially. But Jesus was an imposter. But time after time in the book of Acts, we find the story of how the Lord appeared to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What was his question? Who art thou, Lord? What was his answer? I'm the one that you're persecuting. Paul changed sides. Paul then became someone who preached the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. What did he have to be gained? Paul was the most favored man in all of Palestine. He was the one that cared enough to go and seek out and search and destroy as much as he could all those who stood up for the church and would die for the church. He was the number one bounty hunter to, to destroy the church. If anyone as smart as he was, would be able to show the evidence there's no such thing as the resurrection. It would have been Paul. But his life changed. His reputation in Israel was, was forever condemned because he then began to tell about the way that he persecuted. What changed his mind? Seeing the resurrected Lord. When it comes time to, to a testimony, when you look at the witnesses, there are certain things that you hope you find in witnesses. Are they competent? Well, let me ask you, were the disciples competent? Yes. Were they reliable? Yes, they were. They spent three years with the Lord. Were they in a position to know the facts? <laughs> yes, they were. They would have been with the Lord for three, three and a half years and then fled at his arrest. And then as we mentioned, had to be convinced of the resurrection and Jesus appeared to them on several occasions. And that final occasion that he mentioned, that we mentioned at his ascension, he appeared to them. What did they have to gain by the hoax, as some people call it? They gave their lives for that. Outside of the Apostle John, who died in prison and captivity, they all, from what history says, died because of, this, because of the preaching. Why would anybody give so much? You couldn't find anybody in all the history of mankind, a group of people who had to sacrifice more and give more and die for a lie. It wasn't a lie to them. It was the life-changing event because it happened because it's the truth. And I, there are notes that I have that I could go on for two or three sermons that shows you the evidence of history is combined evidence of the scriptures. Evidence in other, like for example, anybody ever heard of Josephus? The great Jewish historian paid by the Romans to record things. Here's what, here's what Josephus said. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him many Jews and also many of the Greeks. This man was the Christ. And when Pilate had condemned him to the cross upon his impeachment by the principal man among us, those who had loved him from the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive on the third day, the divine prophets having spoken these and thousands of other wonderful things about him. And even now the race of Christians so named for him has not died out. Here was a guy who was not sympathetic with Christianity, but he recorded what he saw. He recorded the truth. He recorded the history. And he said, after examining all the facts, Jesus was resurrected from the grave. He claimed to be the Christ. So the first point, is it real? It's as real as anything has ever happened, folks. 
and therefore we can bank our future on that. Secondly, most importantly, the relevance of the resurrection. What does it mean? And that's really should have what a couple of weeks ago people should be making known about the resurrection. What does it mean? In John chapter 2, the Lord drove out the wicked money changers in the temple because they turned the temple into a den of thieves. If you turn with me there, look at John chapter John chapter 2. The Jews asked him about his authority for doing these things. Let's look at verse 13. John chapter 2. Now the Passover of the Jews were at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he even made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? And he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So when Jesus committed that act that was considered so horrible, destroying the lives of the money changers. Who gives you the authority to do this? He had, he told about his authority. Can you prove you have this authority? What did he point to? He pointed to the resurrection, that he was the son of God. Look at the book of Romans, if you will, chapter one. Book of Romans, chapter one. Begin with verse 1, reading out through verse 4. Romans 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets to the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born to the seed of David according to the flesh. And notice verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. See, you can't look at these passages. How do we know that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? Because of his death, because of his burial, because of his resurrection. Resurrection. You can study religions. I mentioned often that for a number of years in the school of preaching, I taught cults, and I studied a lot of world religions. But you don't find the leader of any other world religion being resurrected because it is the religion. It's the only religion authorized by God. The resurrection also makes salvation possible. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 4. Abraham's righteousness is mentioned there. Here's a man who walked by faith and sin was not imputed to him. Look at verse 20. Referring to Abraham and then making the application to us. He did not waver in the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us it shall be imputed to us who believed in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. See, it, it ties into salvation. You do not have salvation if there's no resurrection. So how important is the resurrection, folks? By the resurrection, we know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. By the resurrection, we know that there is salvation. It all hinges upon the resurrection. And third and finally, the resurrection makes our resurrection possible. This morning, we began looking at the high school class, the teen class. Stories about the rapture. There's interest in that, and there should be. Eschatology, the doctrine of the last things, has been a been a, a popular doctrine, especially over the last 30 or 40 years. The Left Behind series and all kinds of books written by Hal Lindsey and others have been propagated and embraced by millions of people who claim to be religious. The rather fanciful and wild-eyed doctrines come from that, that people believe because they want to believe it. The wishful thinking forces it. But scriptures after scriptures are referred to that don't show that. But the Bible does show things that will happen. We can know about the resurrection. 
in almost, I don't know how many funeral sermons are down through the years, over a hundred, I know. There's not one, not been one sermon I've ever presented that didn't first, somewhere in there, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Begin reading with me, verse 20, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead, has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, first fruits afterward, those who are Christ in his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And so to the church at Corinth, they was embroiled in all kinds of controversy. They had every kind of imaginable church problem. And the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, had to deal with that. One of the grandest themes is found near the end, in chapter 15, as he discusses life beyond the grave. Why that? Why is the resurrection so important? Because if there's life beyond the grave, folks, there's judgment coming. One of the reasons why so many people do not want to believe there's life beyond the grave because they don't want to believe in God. Because if you believe there's a God, most people understand there's going to be a day of accounting. There's going to be a day of, of judging. And people don't want that. But it is going to happen. It's proven. And the resurrection helps us to see that. But the resurrection of Christians after the grave is one of the greatest means of motivation you can find. If a man dies, shall he live again? The answer is yes. I mentioned to the class this morning. Maybe your experience has been different. Anybody ever gone to the funeral service of an atheist? Gone to the cemetery, to the burial? I've never done that. Nobody's ever invited me to do that. I don't know very many atheists have died and that I'm close enough to the family to go. But as I've mentioned, I've been to over a hundred funerals. Some of my own family that I miss, and some of this family here, and Christians that I've known all the days of my life since the first funeral that I attended. But even though it was sad, if you believe in the resurrection, you're someone who has hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we get to verse 51. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment, the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet, where the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death was swallowed up in victory. Death, where's your sting? Oh, hate is where's your victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, here it is, knowing the resurrection to be true. What do we do then? Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I had a conversation with someone recently who used to attend in times past. There's interest in that again. We've been going through tough times in recent years. But there's a statement that this person said that I had made repeatedly over the course of the years that they heard my preaching. That they heard me say time and time again, the best is yet to come. And they mentioned how that would help them in the dark hours when their family has been assaulted, when the bad things are happening to family members and loved ones and sons and daughters. To know that life is more than this place, folks. There's life beyond the grave. For those of you who have buried dead, you probably understand what happens because of grief and the power of it. For so many weeks and months, maybe a year or two, when you think of that person's name, you think of what you no longer have. You think about experiences, things that you did, joyful times that you loved, childbirths, marriages, so many things that God has made us in his, with, a, with a soul 
And he's given us this great capacity to love and be loved. And to experience life on this earth can be a wonderful thing. Even though there's heartbreak, still life on this earth, if you've learned to love as a Christian loves, you fall in love with people. And therefore, by the very nature, the way we've been made, it will mean sadness when they're no longer there. But after a while, the Christian's perspective begins to change. And some of you maybe will agree with what I know now. The loved ones that I've missed, what I think of when their name is mentioned, it's always where they are now. That's where my focus is. That gives me comfort. That gives me consolation. That gives me hope. Does it do you? That's what the Bible means. That's what this that's what this sermon's about, about the resurrection. The resurrection, the fact of it, the reality of it, the meaning of it, changes everything. But what are those people who are confused or told bad things? And like for example, turn to first Corinthians chapter four. I mentioned the class this morning that oh, you find in, in the epistles written false doctrine that some had embraced in these various churches. And unfortunately, one of the areas of false doctrine embraced by the church of Thessalonica was false teaching regarding the, the, the Lord's coming. Chapter 1, or 1 first, first Thessalonians deals with that. 2 Thessalonians deals with that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning of verse 13, Paul is dealing with the onslaught of what had happened because there were people there who said, your mom and dad, are those people that you loved who, who, who died as Christians? You'll never see them again. They're gone. And that would be a sad thing. But that's not the truth. And Paul answers that. Look at verse 13. I want, I want you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. I mentioned there are those who are atheists, who walk away from the grave and the cemeteries with no hope whatsoever. How sad that must be. But see, you don't have to sorrow as others who have no hope. What, what's it mean by confidence? You do have hope. Well, why so, Paul? He explains it. Look at it. Well, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. There it is. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. What are we saying in putting all these scriptures together? When our loved ones die, where do they go? All the departed spirits who have ever lived on this earth in one place is called the Hades of the world, Hades. There are two part compartments there. One where the saved are, and one for the unbelievers, for those who are in torment. Jesus, as he was dying there on the cross, he was crucified between two thieves. Remember one of them that began to be impressed by how Jesus suffered and how he died? He said, Lord, remember me when you come in your, when you come in your kingdom. What did he tell him? Today you'll be with me in paradise. And there is that place. Jesus died, went to, that, went to that realm of all the departed spirits, paradise, Hades. It exists. And there all the people redeemed and unredeemed of all the ages, there they remain until the day the trumpet sounds. And there'll be the resurrection. And those in Christ will rise first, meet the Lord in the air, and they'll come back for us. And those of us who remain will rise up to meet them. So is there any advantage for those people who were misinformed that your mom and dad and loved ones are all gone? Here's the truth. You can believe again. You can hope again. You will see them again. They'll be raised with Christ first. As we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it won't take long in a moment, the twinkle of an eye, all that transpires. They come back. We meet the Lord in the air. Put together that with 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we'll all be presented with the thought, there'll be that great judgment seen. All will know then, let me say it again, all will know then where they will spend eternity and why. I'm convinced that at the judgment, no one will say, I think he made a mistake. I think when the books are open and God's standard with the words of Jesus, which judges, John chapter 12, verse 48, are clearly made known. Here's the standard 
But as each name is called, each person comes up, they're measured by the standard. That the blood of Jesus did not cover their sins, they remain in their sins. They will taste the judgment. That even though they may not willingly chose it, they chose it by their apathy and neglect. They will know for sure then, all those souls in heaven, all those souls in hell will not say he made a mistake with me, I believe. They will know clearly. And all, there'll be no atheists then. All will know there's a God. And there's the Lord Jesus who died and was buried and rose again. Two more passages of scripture, First John. Chapter three, believe in this. Knowing the love that's behind this great story, it should be an encouragement. And as Darrell went through a lot of a lot of months of teaching on First John. First John is a wonderful book. Well, some of those inspiring words are found in chapter three of First John. Begin in verse one: Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but catch this: but we know that when He is revealed. We shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. I wonder what that body will be like. Well, I wonder what the Lord's body will be like. You, you got to get a hint there. What's implied there? Turn with me to the book of Philippians. Look at chapter 3. The last two verses. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the work about which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. If a man dies, shall he live again? The answer is a resounding yes. And knowing that should make all the difference in the world. I mentioned often as I was a young man growing up in the faith, I would meet sometimes older Christians. And they didn't seem to fear death as I did as I got older. They seemed to welcome death. I didn't understand that then. I thought, well, if their bodies are broken like it is, you can see why. I mean, uh, one of our students asked me in class the other night that it doesn't have the best body in the world. Will my body hurt like this when I get there? What's the answer? No. We looked at Revelation chapter 21. There's a new heaven and new earth. Oh, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. All will be made new. That body will be ours for eternity. And one of the things that appeals to me now about that place, there'll be no more sin there. Revelation chapter 20, closing verse, it tells what's going to happen to the devil and all of his angels. They'll be thrown in that lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone forever. Without him having any influence on, on an existence, how precious that life must be. No sin. No shame. No waking up and saying, well, there's been another shooting. Or seeing someone victimized or marriages fail, children abused. It's all gone. Why would we not want to go there? Has there been anything in your life that looking at the end of it would be a relief? I'll tell you, you know, I, most of you know I was in the military for 10 years. I rode a submarine around for five years. I was ready to get off that boat. My last patrol was the hardest as far as work expected. I got less sleep on that last patrol than any other patrol. I was the lead in first class by then, had all kinds of responsibility. I mean, they wore me out, but I kept a smile on my face. You know why? It was my last patrol. There's a term the military has in summary, a short timer. You can understand, somebody's time is short. And there's an expression, how, how short am I? I'm so short I can sit on a dime and dangle my legs over the side, that's short. 
We've come up with expressions to indicate how short we were. No matter how many times they woke me up, I thought, well, this is the last time I'm going through this because when this patrol is over, I'll never go to another patrol, and I didn't. I got out to preach. But I, I could deal with that patrol because I know at the end of it, the hard work will be ended as far as that would be concerned. There are things in life we want to happen. Because of that, we work hard. School, marriages, businesses. But the most important life is the Christian life. And how many times have you seen someone say, or maybe you said someone to someone to a family member who's held the hands and said goodbye as the loved ones closed their eyes and breathed their last breath? Have you ever said these words? He's now earned the victory. That's his. Those encouraging words, folks. But we shouldn't think about them only when we go to a funeral. The death and the resurrection of, Christ, of our Lord should be something, a theme that keeps our life and mind and work going every single day. The best is yet to come. In times past, I told about this lady by the name of Aunt Marty. Anybody remember Aunt Marty's story? She was an older lady and lived life many years as a, as a successful Christian. And she called the preacher one day and she said, Preacher, I need to come over here. I got I to gotta talk to you about some things. And he didn't know what it's about. He didn't know she was in bad health. He goes over there and she said, I'm just going to tell you right out, I'm going to die. I've got eternal disease. Well, not long for this. Well, I'm so sorry. No, don't be sorry for me. But I'm here to make the final arrangements. I want these verses to be read, these points to be made. But I want something done unusual for me. When they see my body in that casket, I'm going to have a fork in my hand. And I want you to explain the reason. Anybody heard this story? And she said, well, what's the reason for the fork? She said, remember all those wonderful fellowship dinners? <laughs> remember sometimes that the really good desserts and they say, Marty, keep your fork. The best is yet to come. When they look at my cold, dead body in that casket, I want them to know my last message to them with that fork is. You tell them. And Marty says, the best is yet to come. And folks, we need to be telling people that story. We need to be living that story. And you will, if you understand the relevance, the reality of the resurrection. Can you imagine what it was like for Peter? Sad after seeing his Lord die on that, on that Friday afternoon. And then to be told he's alive by the women and run to the grave along with John and get there and he's not there and thinking, could he be alive? And then he shows up. They were startled at first thinking they were seeing a ghost. Can you imagine what it would have been like then to see the resurrected Lord in the flesh, to be among the, the 500 who saw him at one time, wouldn't it be back, and if you had the chance to go back in the time capsule and be there, what things would you want to see? I'd want to be one of those who saw the resurrected Lord, wouldn't you? And there were those who saw it, they were witnesses all the days of their life from that point on to death. And so must we be witnesses today that yes, there's the resurrection from the grave. Yes, God raised him up. And yes, God will one day raise us up to victory. Give us that body that we'll be able to enjoy the fruits of eternity forever for the redeemed. So this morning, there's a fount of blessings flowing for those who are not redeemed. The invitation is now being given for those who have not yet responded to the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord. It's real. Secular history records the life of our Lord. He lived. Secular history shows that time and time again. The Bible shows that. That's the clearest, truest record. He came for a reason. He came for us. He came to die. But we have our part to respond in humble obedience to the terms of the gospel. The very first day when they realized they were lost, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Those are people who believe the story of Peter and others. They were told, every one of you repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And today I give you the offer that Peter gave those people back then. The same plan of salvation today that's given to them then and will always be given, should be, 
till that trumpet sounds. And so if you're not availed yourself of that, why not? Why not? Why not today say yes? Make the greatest, grandest commitment of all. The greatest challenge you ever be given is where you'll spend eternity. If you've not made that preparation, you need to do that today, right now. And for those of you who have in times past been faithful, but you're no longer, you know that, realize that, you're in harm's way, you put yourself there, you've got the chance to repent and have the same blood redeem your soul again. If you repent and confess, and that's for the prayers of the church. So we're here, I'm just giving you the Lord's invitation. It's his. What will you say? Think about this now. Together we stand and sing. Will you come? There's a fountain free just for you and me. Let us haste, so oh, haste to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all. this morning before we sing that and before we take the Lord's Supper we're going to sing 313 313 we're going to sing the first, second and fourth verse let us sing on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the
to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the as a wondrous attraction for me, for the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the Change it someday for a crown to that old rugged cross. I will ever be true in shame and reproach. to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my troll at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a Anyone who has studied the Bible very much knows that the church at Corinth had its problems. There was all kinds of things that had gone wrong in that congregation. And so the scripture says that the house of Chloe had written to Paul and they told him about the problems that were there. One of them was problems with partaking of the Lord's Supper. It seems that people were bringing food to the church building not to have a fellowship necessarily but to eat while they were there the scripture says therefore when you come together in one place it is not partake of the lord's supper that is they they didn't seemingly come to partake of the lord's supper but to do something else he says for in eating one takes his own supper ahead of others and one is hungry and another is drunk so it was a drunken party, a meal. They just had it all wrong. But how, how could they get something wrong, that wrong, and just something to be so simple? Just these two emblems right here. Well, it tells us in uh, uh, verse 30 of uh, 1 Corinthians 11, for this reason many are sick, spiritually sick, uh, and, and many are weak spiritually weak and many sleep and the word for sleep there is translated to be dead and so that doesn't have to be us though does it we have done this long enough and studied about it enough 
that we know exactly what's going on. We know exactly what's happening. So let's try during this period to think about the Lord's death and remember his death until he comes again. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that you've given it this time to come together so that we could in a collective way take or take of the supper that you set for us in the long ago. And Father, we pray that each one is about to partake of this now will remember uh, that uh, it is a time of memorial, a time to remember uh, the Lord's death. For all this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. And as we partake of this emblem this morning, which represents the blood of Christ, again, let us think about this and what it means. As Bill has mentioned earlier in his uh, sermon today, a meaning of the resurrection. Well, we need to have the meaning in our mind of what we're doing right now and concentrate and meditate upon it as we do this. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you've given us this emblem represents the blood of your son as he hang on that cross. Now we pray that each one of us, as we partake of this, will do so in a way that will be pleasing in thy sight. For all this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. also taught in scripture as we come together upon this day to give back to the Lord as, as we have been prospered and when we look at our prosperity we can see how, how, how great we've been blessed so as we think about all the ways that the Lord has, has, has blessed us let us now uh, turn and give a portion back to him at this time there will be 